thanks for joining us uh, again if you already joined the first session uh, of today's Indo-Pacific seminar and its engagement with Europe. Uh, the first session that we did today was on trade and I think uh, the session that we'll be dealing with now is actually a good follow-up uh, because we'll be talking about connectivity and uh, how connectivity plays into the European uh, Indo-Pacific agenda. There was a European uh, Asia connectivity agenda that was published in 2018. Uh, there's the EU Indo-Pacific strategy that uh, uh, comprises of connectivity as one of its seven major priorities. And a few weeks ago, well, two weeks ago now, um, the EU released actually its global gateway strategy, which is um, a very open uh, alternative to the China's BRI, Belt One Belt One Road uh, initiative. And the idea there is for the EU to put up investment up to 300 billion euros over the course uh, of the 2021-2027 period. I have to say, incidentally, um, Josep Borrell, the EU's high representative, and Jutta Urpilainen, uh, the commissioner for international partnership, published an op-ed today in the Indian uh, newspaper, The Hindu, on how uh, the Global Gateway was supposed to help the EU and India be better partners. And I'll just quote uh, a sentence for you because I think it will help uh, launch our discussion now. They say, at heart, the Global Gateway is about demonstrating how democratic values offer certainty and fairness for investors, sustainability for partners, and long-term benefits for people around the world. The EU and India can be leaders in this endeavor. We'll be trying to understand with my stellar panel today what connectivity is, how it plays into both the trade and climate agenda, because what the EU is looking at for the next, uh, the next budgetary period is also implementing um, the climate, the, the green transition and the digital transition. And the Global Gateway is supposed to be one instrument for the EU not only to do that in its own borders, but also to project this power elsewhere. And I think this is really are going to be interesting into how it plays into the Asian agenda, because we've been hearing quite a bit about how the Global Gateway is going to help EU-Africa relations, but I think uh, we'll be looking at uh, a bit further away into the Pacific today. Uh, I'm very glad to be joined today by Romana Vlahutin, Ambassador at Large for Connectivity from the European External Action Service, William Chung, Senior Research Fellow at the ICS Yusof Ishak Institute, Roki Intan, a researcher at the Department of International Relations, CSIS Indonesia, uh, and Michael Kano Aishman, who is a senior research fellow at the Klingendale Institute in the Netherlands. Um, I'd like to start with Romana now, and maybe, sorry, just add to everyone who is listening to us online, you can uh, use the raise hand function if you want to ask questions uh, later for the discussion, or you can also put your question directly in the chat. I will read it uh, out loud later. But let's start with you, Romana, because you are uh, quite a centerpiece to this. You've been following connectivity issue and representing the EU on connectivity for the past few years. Could you maybe guide us a bit into what the EU's thinking is and maybe how it has evolved also in the, in the past few months? The floor is yours. Uh, hello, Tara. Hello, everyone. Very happy to be with you. Um, I will try. <laughs> I will uh, try to, to put you ideas uh, for all of us in this on the cyber table so that we can um, discuss but let me uh, let me uh, pick up where you uh, left uh, that's the upgrade of the european connectivity strategy from 218 which was eu asia connectivity strategy which was a convergence strategy not investment strategy so very soon after starting working on it, uh, it became clear that in order to have convergence at a scale that we need, there has to be a solid investment package as well. You can't divide the two. And uh, it is determined by, I think, uh, also some very clear needs on the market. Uh, it is clear that developing countries are, um, in a massive need of new generation of infrastructure. And I think the moment is really unique in terms of uh, our ability to support twin green and digital transitions 
which should help developing countries, if you wish, even jump a generation of development, especially with the, with the digital uh, transition. So um, this was uh, very well understood. The second element that also uh, became very clear is that we need to look at connectivity in a much more comprehensive way. Traditionally, uh, it was seen as something that boosts or generates economic growth. But I think everyone now understands that uh, infrastructure creates to a very large extent, extent the strategic environment that we operate in. Uh, infrastructure can control, gives you control over data, over communication, over trade routes, supply chains, energy, transportation. And it's very easy to weaponize it. It's very easy to use it to, uh, to negative ends. Um, it has long-term foreign and security policy implications. And I think this is something, again, that is uh, very well understood across the board. Uh, and by helping and supporting developing countries build necessary infrastructure, uh, we support not only their economic growth, but also their resilience and their competitiveness. By doing that, we support our own economic growth, resilience, and, and competitiveness. Um, let me move briefly to, to Global Gateway. I already said an upgraded, up, updated, if you wish, uh, um, EU Asia strategy. First, I think it sends a very, very clear political message. You have touched on that. You uh, mentioned values. Uh, connectivity is value-based. And this is something which is a fundamental underlining logic of it. Uh, sustainability and level playing field are the two key elements of, of that uh, value matrix. Uh, also, I think the Global Gateway strategy sends a clear political message on EU positioning in terms of its uh, global uh, role. Um, we do have uh, capacity, capacities. We have global capacities to be one of the, of the leading powers when it comes to connectivity. But it also reminds us that uh, we need to have very focused um, approach to scale. Scale is super important. You can't do changes unless you have scale. And here um, we, we had to think of how to counter fragmentation, which for very long uh, has been uh, uh, an unfortunate uh, element in, in our uh, foreign activities, because you know, we were coming in million different programs and a million different names. So what uh, is very clear that we need to focus and we need to pool resources. When you look at numbers, European Union is already the largest global ODA donor, the largest global uh, provider of DI, but it's scattered all over. So I think branding and calling it, uh, having this umbrella brand uh, of Global Gateway is gonna help a lot, uh, both internally and externally to understand what exactly are we doing and how much uh, of that is. It also um, is important that this is all of the EU approach. <clears throat> This is something, I mean, that has to have uh, absolutely included not only institutions, but member states and financial institutions as well. So we do it all together. This is how, uh, how this scale can be ensured at the level that are needed. Uh, also, the combination of instruments. We are not talking only about neighborhood and development instrument, which is going to be sort of the main part of the guarantee facility but we're talking about a possible uh, new uh, instrument for export credits, uh, and then also combination of Invest Europe, Horizon, and many other uh, financial streams that are at our disposal, trade instruments. And there are, you know, the toolbox is quite, quite large, and I think um, there is a lot we can offer in that sense. What is going to be critical here is to get the private sector on board. I think we have to create an environment where private sector will understand what we want to do, 
and will want to join us. And I think we all need to understand collectively, both us as, as possible donors, but also countries, the recipient countries, what are the environments, the regulatory environments that will be most conducive for the large scale private private investment? I think it's really critical because it would also allow for the transfer of knowledge. It will allow for a much more integrated approach uh, to, to, to connectivity long term. We also have to have clarity on priorities. We can't do everything. Uh, it would make no sense. So I think in terms of platforms, we have to sort of agree our priorities like digital, energy, um, but also innovation and skills. I think, you know, uh, at all times, we have to be absolutely clear that investment in people, investment in knowledge, investment in innovation and research is a critical part of what we want to do. Um, in terms of geography, uh, I think it's uh, self-understood that for European Union, uh, our neighborhood and Africa are, are there by, by definition, but there is a very large focus on Indo-Pacific, uh, especially ASEAN, which leads me to my final um, sentence on partnerships. We have already uh, created partnerships, connectivity partnerships with Japan and India. There is a ministerial statement uh, on connectivity with ASEAN and uh, with an idea or ambition to also um, negotiate connectivity partnership with ASEAN, uh, which gives us an opportunity for close convergence, but also working together not always necessarily in co-financing because that's a bit difficult given different administrative arrangements, budget cycles, et cetera, but understanding the needs and thinking about the labor division. It is really important that this is done in a way which is uh, well organized. Uh, I hope that the G7 platform uh, is going to help. Germany is um, uh, leading this year. Uh, next year. And uh, I think you should expect for a lot of European inputs into the discussions um, in G7. But it is really important that the coordination is done in a way that is efficient, that is user friendly, that is also producing quick results. Uh, this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. This is a long term investment. But we should uh, we should start with something uh, important and significant as well. So to show through models and, and, and flagships, what does it look like when you invest in value based connectivity? So I'll stop here. Thanks a lot. I think you paved the way for a lot of the discussion that we'll have later on. Uh, without further ado, I'll turn to the region and give the floor to William Chu for a view uh, from the ASEAN that you mentioned, Romana, just now. I think it would be very useful to have your view and then Rocky's on, on what this global gateway or the connectivity agenda that Europe is putting forward mean for, for your region. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Tara, and thank you to the GCFR for inviting me um, to this uh, seminar series. Um, I, I'm speaking to you from Singapore, which is probably one of the most hyper-connected cities that you can find um, in, in Asia, if not um, the world. Um, I, I want to make a couple of points actually on Global Gateway, but my discussion will be not only on the Global Gateway, but kind of perceptions of the European Union and its engagement, even with ASEAN and the broader Indo-Pacific. So first off, um, the point I'd like to make is that the European Union has a lot of currency um, in the Indo-Pacific as well as ASEAN. Uh, ASEAN is not the same kind in the same category as the European Union, but ASEAN treats the European Union as a good model um, on how you can run uh, entities like and ASEAN. And I think that the, the way that you framed um, the EU strategy towards the Indo-Pacific, I read all 17 pages, uh, climate change, human security, digital governance, COVID-19 assistance. Yeah, 
they are all good news, uh, especially for, for countries in this region. What I want to say is that connectivity, connectivity is an important element, but it's not the only element that, that uh, ASEAN countries are looking at, and in fact, even in, in the broader Indo-Pacific. So just to have a shameless self-plug here from my institute, we conduct a State of Southeast Asia uh, survey uh, that's conducted every year of more than a thousand kind of think tankers, officials, business people, journalists uh, from Southeast Asia. And from the survey itself, you can see that the European Union does have kind of a, should I say a mixed bag when it comes to perceptions among Southeast Asia. Um, to begin with, um, the most influential economic power and the most influential political secu and security power in Southeast Asia is perceived to be China. And that's actually quite a surprise because for the longest time, the United States was seen to be the most important economic and strategic kind of player. Uh, the European Union ranks fifth on both counts, economic and strategic, and it's after, that's after Japan. Um, but on the bright side, the European Union is actually seen uh, to be a champion on, on providing leadership in the rules-based order and international law. So you beat the United States on that count, and also you're seen as a leader um, on free trade as well. And the good news also is that the European Union is seen to be a potential partner for ASEAN if ASEAN member countries have to choose a kind of external party apart from China and the United States. So that's, that's good news for the European Union. With the Global Gateway, I think it provides uh, a, another kind of option for a lot of Indo-Pacific countries, including ASEAN member states. So we've, we've, we've spoken a lot about the Belt and Road Initiative and the United States has you know, come in with Build Back Better with, G7, with the G7 initiative and that's building kind of elements of President Trump's uh, kind of blue dot network. The Japanese have the enhanced uh, partnership for quality infrastructure and Japan has been in the region for a long time. So, in terms of the infrastructure angle, it's good to hear that the European Union is offering, should I say, uh, at least what I see it to be a theoretical 300 billion euros um, on the table. Uh, you know, focus on essential elements that a lot of countries would like to have, be it op uh, fiber optic cables or, or clean power transmission uh, capacity and, and all that. But I, I think that we need to have a sense of caution here about the global gateway in the sense that we're not, so the finance, uh, I think Tara mentioned 2021 to 2027. Uh, we're not sure actually for now uh, whether the money can be mustered uh, in, in the sense that this is kind of a public plus private sector uh, enterprise. So, uh, as one observer has, has, has noted, we, we haven't actually seen any uh, tangible projects that have been announced yet. So, this is, so in a sense, this is a good uh, conceptual plan. But I think a lot of countries in the region would like to see how this sees uh, fruition in the region, and especially when you compare yourselves to the Chinese and the Japanese. I mean, of course, there are, there are problems with BRI and I do, I do not want to go there because that will take up way too much time. Um, but if, if you look at the Japanese, the Japanese have actually been doing a lot of good work uh, through the years. And in fact, according to some estimates, Japanese actually pip, they actually beat the Chinese in terms of infrastructure financing in Southeast Asia. And that's uh, according to uh, 2020 numbers. Another, some, some other points I'd like to make besides infrastructure is that the European Union cannot just look at the global gateway to be the central plank of how uh, you engage with the Indo-Pacific. And I'll, I'll use my, one of my favorite anecdotes here. 
1935, the French Foreign Minister Pierre Laval spoke to Joseph Stalin. And um, Laval asked of Stalin, you know, can you propitiate the Pope by encouraging Catholicism in, in, in the Soviet Union? And Stalin said, ha, how many divisions, how many army divisions does the Pope have? And I, I, I think that when, when, when we talk about the European Union and the Indo-Pacific, that's, that's the same question that pops up among think tankers and officials. Uh, so we, we, we love it that the European Union is engaged on trade, on investments and on infrastructure, but we would like to see actually more of the European Union when it comes to what you call harder geopolitical realities that are on the ground and on the high seas in the Indo-Pacific. So we, we have seen some traction. I mean, the French defense minister, Florence Pali, speaking at the Shangri-La Dialogue in 2029, she was boasting about how they brought the Charles de Gaulle uh, aircraft carrier to Singapore, accompanied by an escorting ships and you know, with em embarked with kind of British uh, helicopters and uh, a small uh, contingent of British troops. We've seen the UK send their aircraft carrier into the region, the Queen Elizabeth, and uh, they've done exercises with Australia, Japan, and South Korea. But essentially, we, we like to see more, actually, of a European Union when it comes to a military presence um, in the region. I, I think the German Navy is sending one of its uh, 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 ships, the, the Bayern, uh, to the region, and, and the German the head of German Navy will be speaking to a, a double I double S uh, Fullerton lecture uh, two weeks from now. So we, we really like to see more of this because um, that there is a saying that on the high seas, on the contested high seas in the Indo-Pacific, especially in the South China Sea, if you don't use it, you don't practice your international rights for traversing uh, sea lanes of communications, you're going to lose it. And, and I think we, we've seen it. Um, the most visible threat, of course, is what China is doing in the South China Sea and trying to inhibit access to, to both sometimes fish, fisheries, oil exploration, and even uh, military uh, vessels. I, I, I want to switch also to... Um, on, on, since I, I, I speak about the South China Sea, um, there are other elements um, that the European Union um, can contribute besides the global gateway and besides infrastructure financing. And I'm talking here about what Japan has been doing. I mean, Japan is a trusted partner uh, in, in Southeast Asia and, and Rocky will be able to attest to that. Um, Japan has been contributing kind of Coast Guard vessels to countries like Indonesia, to the Philippines, uh, uh, to Vietnam, of course, contributing with kind of their maritime domain awareness. And, you know, given that uh, essentially what you need is maritime police, Coast Guards who are patrolling their exclusive economic zones. And I, I think that if the EU can move, uh, you know, not replicate kind of Japan's uh, uh, strategy kind of carte blanche, but do something along those lines. Um, that would help incredibly. Um, I have one last point here, and um, it's about China and the United States and the, the concept of values. I think Ambassador Romana was, was quite emphatic when she talked about, you know, it's not just about infrastructure, it's about values. And I think this was repeated at the recent G7 uh, summit in July where it, it's talked about we need to build infrastructure, but at the same time, we need to advocate for democratic freedoms and human rights and you know, international law. So at, at this point, I think there is a disjuncture actually between Europe and the Indo-Pacific and specifically ASEAN. So you see, it's not that ASEAN opposes the idea of dem democratic values or human rights. But I think you've got to see it on two levels. On the first level, ASEAN is a hodgepodge of political systems, right? We, we, have, we have a kind of a monarchy to kind of, should I say, uh, regress democracies 
to you know working democracies like Singapore, which was not invited to the United States uh, uh, Democracy Summit, uh, you know, recently. And we have fully functioning democracies like Indonesia and, and, and the Philippines and Malaysia. Malaysia is a bit chaotic, but it's still a democracy. Um, but um, what I want to say is that ASEAN member states will not want to highlight too much on the issue of democratic freedoms. Um, the bigger point being that I think in a sense, we have been acculturized by China. Uh, what do I mean by saying that a lot of ASEAN member states are not willing uh, to raise kind of any issues that will actually row China. And I think this whole issue of democratic freedoms and human rights is, is uh, what I call an issue that will raise a red flag to the Chinese bull. So, um, in, in that sense, I think the European Union needs to tread um, very carefully there and e even for the United States as well, um, because there are, there are sensitivities um, on, the, on the ground when it, when it comes to uh, such issues. Uh, just one more minute. Um, I think Japan has, again, Japan has done very well uh, in, in how it actually manages the whole issue of democracy, human rights, and China. So Japan does not shirk back actually from, from the need for international law or democratic freedoms when it comes to talking to China. But I think Japan does it less, has a less ideological streak when it comes to you know, uh, propagating or advocating the need for democratic freedoms. Um, and it has a kind of astute way of actually handling China uh, in terms of the cooperation slash compete kind of spectrum. And I think the, the, the most recent example that I can bring up is that prime, uh, former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, you know, for, for the longest time, Shinzo Abe, when he was Prime Minister, was considered devil incarnate by, by the Chinese because, you know, he had been very assertive and he has been really muscled out the, muscled up on, on the Japanese military. But it was around 2019 and 2020 where Japan decided that it would cooperate with the Chinese on kind of 50 kind of infrastructure projects that both Japan and China can work together. And, and I think that has seen some traction. So I think for, for the European Union, looking at the Indo-Pacific, studying kind of Jap Japanese precedents is, uh, is quite useful. So I'll, I'll end my presentation here. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, William. I think we had said that we would not discuss hard security matters so much in the seminar today, but I also get your point, and I think I, one of the, the first question in the chat is also about that, so we might have to address the AUKUS uh, issue at some point in the discussion too and its consequences, but for now I'll turn to Rocky. Uh, Indonesia was one of the countries mentioned as, as you know, potential uh, major partner for the EU in, in the Ambassador Mihaya's introduction today. Could, could you give us a sense of what the perception is from where you're standing of what the EU is attempting to do? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Tara. Uh, thank you also as well for the ECFR for inviting me. I am honored very much to be included in this esteemed panel. Um, to bring more value add to the discussion, I would like to bring a more in-country perspective from Jakarta, uh, particularly the perspective of connectivity uh, from Indonesia and ASEAN, uh, particularly on infrastructure projects. Um, I now have two major points in my remarks, uh, one big observation and one simple recommendation. Um, I originally have more points to make, but these have been covered uh, well by Ambassador Romana and Dr. William. So I would simply echo their points on the need for global gateway to mobilize private capital and the complexity for global gateway way of engaging uh, based on values with ASEAN, considering the hodgepodge of different systems within Southeast Asia itself. So first, an observation. Um, we all here understand um, Europe's in the pacific strategy on, on connectivity, uh, particularly in this context, the EU's global gateway is a response to China's Belt and Road. So um, as a shameless plug uh, as well, I would also um, would like to draw upon some insights from my, from my own recent study on China's economic influence in Indonesia 
uh, and Indonesia's own domestic resilience. So we used the Jakarta Bandung high speed rail as a case study on this matter. And I highly suspect that European countries' engagement uh, with Indo Pacific countries would encounter similar challenges and opportunities in partnering with Indonesia, for example, on um, certain similar connectivity projects. So um, hopefully this observation can bring some lessons learned for connectivity cooperation between Europe and the Pacific countries. So first, um, our study found that the simplistic depth trap narrative on Bud and Road is simply to be too simplistic, uh, so to speak. The Indonesian domestic elite uh, did manage to actively shape the agreement on the Jakarta Bandung high speed rail, especially during the bidding process between China and Japan, uh, because there was an intense, um, infamous bidding process on that project. And Indonesia is not, it's not a, just a passive taker here, um, such as the narrative suggested. Um, what's happening here is, is not a behavior change by Beijing towards Jakarta, but simply preference amplification where there's an alignment of interest on collaborative projects between local elites. So because of this competition between Tokyo and Beijing, Jakarta managed to leverage for a better final deal in which uh, Beijing agreed to drop the government guarantee for the project. So meaning there is no formal requirement for the government to foot the bill. And the broader lesson here for Europe is to actively engage domestic actors in the Pacific for such creativity projects will yield further results later on. And second, uh, the high-speed web project is on all good marks as well, unfortunately, for Indonesian resilience. The planning process for the project was frankly chaotic. Um, for example, it usually took a year for a project in Indonesia to gain an environmental permit, but for this particular project, it only took less than a month. So it suggests that there's something else going on besides fair rule of law. And there's also lack of coordination between different government levels of coordination on government in Indonesia. So for example, some municipalities did not even know until the very end that houses, buildings in the jurisdictions need to be demolished to make way for the construction. So these factors um, first have as a planning process lack of coordination between government levels. I suspect as well that Europe will also have to deal with these factors later on in engaging with um, Indo-Pacific countries on connectivity projects. And in general, uh, from the perspective of Jakarta, uh, we welcome the participation and cooperation of like-minded countries everywhere on connectivity, particularly if it helps us to diversify our relations further. So next, a simple recommendation on the matter would be um, concerning the mode of cooperation on connectivity. Um, minilateral or plurilateral cooperation, as mentioned in the previous session um, on trade, is the way to go, um, I think. So, um, August, uh, I understand it's a bit of a sensitive topic for certain European countries if we, if we bring up AUKUS, but um, AUKUS simply is a symptom of a broader shift towards more multilateral projects of cooperation among countries in the Pacific. Um, as the previous session has noted, trade multilateralism is alive and well in the Pacific, but there has been a noticeable shift towards more smaller cooperation among like-minded countries. We see this, for example, in the quad grouping and also in AUKUS on security, for example, as well. We see this in, in the emerging trilateral cooperation between India, Indonesia, and Australia. And on digital connectivity, we also see this in the digital economic partnership agreement between Singapore, Chile, and uh, New Zealand. So this mode of multilateral cooperation should go both ways for both Europe and the Pacific countries. Um, avenues for connectivity for, of cooperation should be explored uh, between like, the countries in Europe and the Pacific. We obviously welcome the participation of larger institutional frameworks of the EU and or ASEAN, for example, but um, this shouldn't be a hard requirement that discourages deeper modes of engagement between countries in the region. So let me stop there and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks a lot. That was extremely helpful. And yes, I think I'll, I'll pick up on a few of your points during the Q&A. Um, we are circling back to Europe now. 
with Micah. Uh, if you could give us uh, your impression of what uh, the ambition the EU holds for the Indo-Pacific now, and I should clarify also one point uh, uh, that William mentioned at some point, the Global Gateway is not going to be the only platform for the EU's engagement in the Indo-Pacific. Its first platform is, of course, the strategy it published uh, a few months ago, well, four months ago now, but it, the Global Gateway plays into that. Um, Micah, the floor is yours. Yes, well, thank you so much for uh, for this uh, discussion. Um, and, and to respond to that, I think uh, connectivity was one of seven pillars included in the Indo-Pacific strategy. So that already shows uh, you know, that this is one element of a bigger uh, attempt to engage the Indo-Pacific. Um, and maritime uh, was another issue, uh, William. So that would be uh, it, for that reason for a different panel. Although, of course, you know, we are in the region, they're very closely related. And um, yeah, so I think it, what I would like to emphasize on Global Gateway that this is really also not a really new thing. Um, few people will probably realize it. This is actually, to my mind, the third attempt uh, for the EU to deal not so much with BRI, um, but with China's growing presence and role and influence um, in the world and specifically in the Indo-Pacific region. And there's, of course, a subtle difference because about BRI, there, you know, the modalities are oftentimes uh, not the way that uh, you would like to see them. But the initiative as such and the projects that are actually when they are being implemented in, you know, uh, for, according to local uh, re local regulations and with openness and transparency, that's a very welcome thing. So I'm, I, I would actually oppose any view that this is countering China's BRI. It is a response, you know, it's trying to offer countries sort of an, another alternative next to what uh, BRI has to offer, because of course with BRI, you know, countries also uh, adopt more uh, you know, interoperability, compatibility with Chinese systems, and there's uh, growing questions on whether you would want that. And I think the EU is now realizing that it's not in the EU's interests, you know, it's a self in, in its own self-interest if that were to happen. It also, we also hear, um, as, as William was referring to, you know, from those that your, your institutes poll, I think they were excellent. And I'm actually curious, was this also was already a sort of a prelude to your forthcoming uh, State of uh, Asia 2022, or was it 2021 still? I'm definitely looking forward to, uh, to the one that will probably come out in January. Um, and I've used it in, indeed also in, in many of my presentations to argue for you know, the fact that indeed countries are welcoming the EU's view because in, in Europe, you know, we oftentimes get the question, you know, why should we all go all the way there? You know, what's, what's in it for us? And do those countries actually welcome us there? And, and um, you know, knowing what countries want there, I think is an important uh, starting point for the EU. That's also, I see where global gateway is different from those uh, two other attempts. And let me clarify, the first attempt was, I think, the economic diplomacy agenda. Um, that was uh, more domestically oriented, uh, but this was also responding to the clash of capitalism that we saw happening already, you know, uh, 10 years ago, uh, al although it was not on the agenda then, I think it was 2015 that the EU started um, devising this, this European economic diplomacy agenda. Um, and, uh, you know, there was very little traction because there were just too many opportunities still. I think the benefits uh, did not outweigh so much the challenges that we see now. Um, so the second attempt was, of course, the already mentioned EU uh, Asia connectivity agenda, and it's really interesting actually to see then that today, the, you know, the, our focus now on this discussion is on the Indo-Pacific, and Indo-Pacific is not mentioned in Global Gateway. Um, you know, specific individual countries are. Um, so here you see you have to really look at these two initiatives in tandem, right? And I think I would add to that also, you know, the, Europe's new the Green Deal and the Digital Compass. They are also, you know, for, for countries in the region, if they're looking at, you know, what, you know, where can we really engage with the EU, you really also need to develop an understanding of those um, investments that the EU is making in those specific thematic fields, because the digital is, I think, an important one. So what is new now, if this is already the third attempt, and let's hope that the third time will be the charm, as they say, um, I think the big difference now is that uh, the, the push is really very firm from the very top level. I think Romana has been, you know, done an excellent job in highlighting, you know, the importance of this issue. But let's face it, you know, the external action service is just one player in this bigger game. Um, so it's important now that the, 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 the president of the European Commission is sort of taking charge, her cabinet is taking charge, they are pushing 
all EU institutions for an integrated approach. And if the e external action service with all due respect is asking for that integrated approach, you know, that's just too much at stake for the others to say, oh yeah, sure, let's do this. So that's an important difference now. There's a new level of energy and there's a new level of, of commitment and push for change that I think is really important. Um, what is interesting also is that uh, the DG for International Partnerships that used to be the Development Cooperation Agency uh, is now in a, you know, has a bigger role. This is also you know, why much of the focus, I think, will turn to sort of the uh, Europe's own neighborhood. Um, and I think you know, the Indo-Pacific strategy will make sure that the EU is also engaged, of course, with, uh, with this region. Um, Another point that I would like to make, and this is evident from my uh, argument that this is actually the third attempt, you know, following on also, also to that economic diplomacy agenda, is that the link with industrial policy is really important. And I think, uh, Rocky, you were making some, some points about international procurement, for example, um, you know, what are the financial instruments that we have in place to actually, you know, help our uh, companies also. Um, and what, how do we bring those companies together in sort of uh, what I think was Romana who actually, uh, you know, coined that idea for, for a business council that we need to get the input from the, uh, the private sector um, and then to help them, you know, in a way that is still conforms to, you know, market rules. Uh, we don't want to uh, be, you know, overly um, doing uh, industrial policy uh, because that would be copying China again in a way that we, you know, where we don't want to go. But there's, a, you know, it's, it's very clear that we need to do slightly more rather than less. And this is a, a huge paradigm shift for the EU that has always, you know, in the past decades adhered to, you know, the market is the one that should, you know, set the rules and, and, and that's, that, that should set. Uh, the stage. So that's a very big shift and this link with industrial policy where we also see a lot of changes in the EU is very important. Um, so what I think is also important now and I see this very much also in the Global Gateway is the positive narrative. Um, it was mentioned several times this is a positive uh, sort of attempt whereas industrial policy is uh, you know mostly about protecting um, you know, this is really about promoting, and, and I very much agree that Japan is a, you know, should be an inspiration for us. Actually, I wrote my PhD on Japan's economic diplomacy 10 years ago, um, so the point I made there I think is still very valid, uh, and now, only now, finally, it's gaining traction in Europe, because we start to understand that, okay, maybe the less ideological you know, but very, you know, firm way by which the Japanese have been trying to promote in their way also human rights and rule of law. Uh, you know, it's very different from the EU, but maybe in that region in particular, it's, it's far more effective. Um, so I, I, I'm very happy to see that also in Global Gateway that we're looking for sort of a positive narrative that highlights alternative opportunities. Um, again, alternatives to growing Chinese influence. Um, and I think that is a more effective way of positioning the EU in this world where we have the, the, the growth and security and stability in that region is also very important for the EU itself. So we want to, to strengthen the resilience and the, uh, and the autonomy, um, you know, and the ability to act of those questions as, as Romana was saying. Um, I would love to say a, more, a few more words, you know, more in detail on, you know, on, on, in the digital domain, what we should be doing, because I think the digital domain is really key here. I'm looking at Tarma and, and at the time, uh, maybe I should just stop here and, and hope that somebody is going to ask a question that will allow me to elaborate because I think this is uh, really important also. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Michael. So actually my first question was going to be about the digital aspect and trying to get a bit more concretely into what connectivity means and how the EU and the Indo-Pacific can be working on it. So I will give you the floor now and we'll go to the three questions and comments that we have in the box. So but I'll, I'll leave you the floor for, for a few more minutes now. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, yeah, so focus on digital. I think, you know, there's there's a lot already being done. Again, let's let's acknowledge that also. Um, but we, we need to have a more sense, strategic sense of purpose with our engagements. I think that's, um, that's an important one. Um, and I would actually uh, distinguish three elements. Hard infrastructure is already mentioned. And, uh, this is really important because we all know that having, you know, the hard infrastructure is a key also enabler of economic growth. Um, we also know that uh, hard infrastructure also comes with, uh, you know, decisions on, um, on, 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 well, it comes with cybersecurity issues um, and it can, can come with, you know, standards 
uh, that are more or less compatible to other jurisdictions. Um, so the question here is how can we create sort of the, the regulatory environment where as many as possible jurisdictions are actually compatible, uh, interoperable with one another. Um, and to the extent that choices have to be made here, obviously for Europe, we would like to, um, well, uh, to, to have that better connection. Because also for Europe is, I think, uh, as, as Romano was saying, still a key investor, a donor, and a, and a trading partner of the region. Um, so investment in the digital economy. I've also argued, I think, next to hard infrastructure, you know, which is you know, what people think of uh, easily, you know, it's the undersea cables and the satellite coverage and the 5G networks. Um, but let's think also of, of other sort of hard slash soft infrastructure, um, and especially the financial uh, sector here is in increasingly important. Uh, digital financial services are also a key enabler of, of, of economic growth. Um, because they, you know, they allow uh, access to a whole new sort of world and a whole new economy for unbanked people. Um, and they uh, thereby create opportunities uh, for growth and development. And I think Europe has a lot of smaller fintech uh, companies that are, have been thriving and are also uh, increasingly moving to sort of open source uh, bottom-up solutions that also are very different from the sort of the big tech drive where you know, monopolies are, are, are also challenging the more local startup and scale ups. So I think there's an interesting uh, debate to be had in, in that specific field. Um, if we're looking at other suggestions, uh, Tara, just to be more specific, um, I think there's some really interesting uh, elements on, for example, the, the single euro payments area uh, that has really also helped um, the EU create that that one market for, uh, for, for finance and, and digital finance um, that can also assist ASEAN countries to leverage those opportunities for you know, cross-border payments, remittances uh, that are also extremely important in the region. So that's, you know, if we're looking for flagship projects of Global Gateway, I think, you know, and we're now looking at the digital domain, let's not just focus on, you know, the very visible with the eye visible projects. I think we also need to look at, to acknowledge that in this field, Flagship projects can be sort of, um, you know, the, the more abstract ones, but we have to label them. So that's lessons learned from that uh, single euro payments area, or for example, the digital identity that is also, you know, about empowering citizens to manage their own digital self on, you know, online, um, and thereby to promote openness and, and, you know, those European principles or values, if you like to call them. We don't have to, um, you know, to, to, to flesh them out in, uh, you know, to, to make it so explicit all the time. Um, but I, I think there's, you know, despite the, uh, the diversity in political system that I think William uh, was talking about, um, I think there's in many governments still a lot of traction uh, for, you know, learning from what the EU is doing. And in the end, you know, choices will be, you know, the final outcomes will be slightly different perhaps compared to Europe, um, but they will definitely be more open and more transparent, I think, than they otherwise would be. And that's uh, already a big win also for, for us in Europe and for the people uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Thanks a lot, Michael. Um, I, so I will read to you uh, the now four questions that we have in the chat, and I can see that Pascal Ab has his, rent, has his hand raised, and so I will go to him as soon as I finish reading. Uh, the first comment that we had was, uh, to add to William's point, to be in a position to be more visible, e.g. naval presence, the EU needs first to define the region as maritime area of interest. Uh, then question, how do we measure success of the global gateway in the Indo-Pacific? What are we to expect in the area 10 years from now? Um, on the eve of President Biden's summit for democracy, the EU launched its Global Europe Human Rights and Democracy Program with 1.5 billion euros of funding. Given William Chung's comments, how does this impact uh, the EU's Global Gateway Initiative? Uh, and finally, uh, thanks for the interesting debate. I would like to ask two questions. Do you foresee major challenges in implementing the Gateway projects and where should we pay attention to avoid blockages? And second question, what the connectivity partnerships with Japan, for, for example, would mean in practice? Joint funding was already mentioned, I think. Would it be more than coordination? Uh, and this is a question from Finland. I will now go to Pascal Ab. If the co-host could help me uh, um, bring Mr. Ab in, that would be very helpful. Um, I think 
Ah, you're you're with us, so please ask your question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I had a question for Ms. Vlahutin about the Global Gateway Initiative. Um, so principally, I mean, it's of course great that the EU is rolling out this new initiative, but I believe the success is not just going to depend on, you know, how much money you pour into it and the kind of political will and ambition that is connected to it, but also the areas which is it targeting. And there, I believe the question is, are we prepared to go where China and also others like Japan are going? So are we prepared to cooperate with countries that, for example, don't quite meet our exacting standards for democratic or clean governance? Are we prepared to risk billions of euros in highly fragile and conflict-affected states? And uh, I suppose that the answer of this question is, is going to depend on a debate that we're having inside the EU about whether infrastructure is more like a tool for the expression of our normative agency or of our uh, interest policy. And I guess the answer is going to be maybe a bit of both, but I would be interested in where you see this going. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so maybe we'll start, we'll go the other way around. We'll start with Micah, then go to Rocky, William, and, and finally uh, Romana. So Micah, you can answer the questions or comments that are most of interest to you, or all of them. Okay, perhaps to the point of, um, uh, would it be more than coordination with Japan? Um, actually, I think, you know, if we were able to coordinate, uh, to me, that would already be worth quite something. Um, and and I'm, I'm saying this with a lot of, you know, sense of realism, um, because uh, if, if we're, for example, talking about huge projects, right, and uh, that are in Japan coordinated, for example, by the, uh, by the Japan International Cooperation Agency, uh, their development promotion, uh, and with a role for also the export uh, credits and then and, and, and private sector, that's all already very difficult to coordinate between Japanese partners. And then, you know, all of a sudden, uh, European players coming in and saying, oh, shall we cooperate? I don't think that's really feasible. You know, that, that was, I think, the initial hope or idea, but we've seen from, you know, from practice and, uh, that this is proving very difficult. And I think that's, you know, that's only very understandable if, if you just think twice. So coordination is, is really important that we are actually uh, ensuring that we, what we do in one country or region can also, you know, can be compatible again with what the Japanese are doing or can contribute or can provide the, the, the foundation. Um, or, for example, whereas the Japanese are stronger on infrastructure, you know, European companies could come in and, and fill that space, um, you know, also benefiting from the market that has been created with uh, that infrastructure. So I think knowing what other countries are doing and, and plan to be doing uh, and, and exchanging information on that is already extremely valuable. Um, and in the ben well, because it will be in the benefit of recipient countries. So I'm actually looking forward to what Rocky and, and William think of that. Um, I'm just noticing that in practice, cooperation between these various actors is different. It's, it's very difficult because already within one any one country, it's it's, it's very difficult. Um, so the um, the same I think can be said for for the United States, um, you know, and and their initiatives, um, and and the budgets attached to this. I you know, I'm always slightly skeptical because first of all, you know, their promises and you never know, you know uh, how much of that will actually be committed, uh, will be actually invested. So I prefer to look at, okay, what is what is happening on the ground? And I think, you know, the, 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 the figures make for, for beautiful headlines uh, at the launch of an initiative, but I think most countries are now really looking for, for again, me to the bone. Um, and that goes for, you know, whether it's in the United States initiatives or otherwise. What is interesting, I think, now is the, the, the understanding that the EU you know, is wanting to cooperate more with partners that share its interests. Um, and I'd be hesitant to call that like-minded countries because we are not always like-minded. Uh, we are actually already cooperating, you know, um, and, and here you see that our approach is already shifting to respond to that, uh, the point I think made by, by Pascal. Um, are we willing to work with countries that don't meet our, our standards? Uh, well, 
projects have to be commercially viable for a company to enter, uh, you know, into it. That's that's you know one stand, uh, fact of life that we also have to to deal with. You know, to what extent they can be enticed with you know specific instruments to go perhaps where they might otherwise not go. That is a, perhaps the interesting space that I think we need to explore here in Europe much more than we have been doing before when we just left everything to the market. There's now more space to actually work with companies, but that also means we have to listen to, okay, what are your concerns then in you know, the regulatory environment on the ground? And here they have been complaining for a long time and I think not always they felt that they were heard. So the EU also has to listen more to its own stakeholders because only then can we create ownership that is that is needed now as, as Romana was already also saying. Well, the, leave it to the others to, uh, to say more. Thanks a lot. Uh, Rocky, on to you. Um, probably I will try uh, to comment a little bit on the first question that Mr. Pascal asked, um, because I think the question is not supposed to be answered by me, but by, by the Europeans in a sense. But definitely that is an interesting question that should be explored whether Europeans are actually ready to work with countries who are not on the same page with Europe on values or even um, to it, like Indonesia arguably is probably the most electorally democratic of countries in Southeast Asia, electorally speaking. But we are still plagued by problems of rule of law, um, as I mentioned in um, remarks uh, earlier on, um, projects need, uh, projects happen on a half hazard basis on, on, in terms of planning, lack of, lack of coordination, and there are also aspects of the project in the high speed rail, for example, um, that in which we need that in, in which Indonesia needs influential middlemen, so to speak, for the project to happen because um, the planning process, the implementation process is simply too chaotic. Um, is Europe ready to work on that um, based on global gateway? And if does, how, and that's an interesting question as well, like does Europe see infrastructure as an aspiration or um, aspirational pro value project or as, you know, as a project for strategic uh, initiative with, with, with its own interest in mind. Um, and going into the question or the comment by some, uh, Ms. Micah on uh, the trilateral cooperation, so to speak, uh, co joint co-funding um, between Europe and a third party and for funding in, in, in an Indo-Pacific context, um, I'm not sure I can help, um, I could pinpoint right now on top of my head exactly if there are collateral cooperation in that regard. But I do understand that the, in, in Indonesia, there is a cooperation on ARISE uh, in which EU helps Indonesia on the project of trade uh, facilitation. I understand that there has been some small scale nascent uh, cooperation with the Fed of Australia on the matter, but I'm not sure that um, cooperation is actually there for scaling up projects. But um, I'm, I'm, I'll be interested to hear what Dr. William had, had anything to add on, the, on that. So William, on to you. Yeah, thanks for that. I think there was uh, a lot of questions front loaded, um, but I, I will tackle the question about, again, on, on values and, and the global gateway. I, I, I'm of the view that um, you, you have to be a bit more circumspect uh, when it comes to advocating uh, democratic values. Um, I mean, take for example, the, the biggest challenge for ASEAN and ASEAN centrality today and in 2022 will be Myanmar. Uh, and, and Myanmar represents the, the, the toughest test for ASEAN. Uh, in, in its 54 uh, year history. And um, what say Myanmar, what say Thailand, uh, which is a government that came to, to power a couple of years ago by less than democratic uh, means, uh, Cambodia and Laos, uh, which, which are, sh should we say, unique uh, political systems, uh, one party, uh, systems. So if the European Union really wants to talk about global gateway and building tangible infrastructure projects, where do you start 
uh, with these countries? I mean, are you, are you going to say that uh, since you're not adhering to, to kind of European Union democratic standards of what a political system should be, um, that there will be no funding uh, forthcoming? So I, I, I know that's like a million dollar question, but if, if you look at, again, <laughs> And Michael will, will like the fact that I'm bringing out this topic. Again, we have to look at Japan. Um, Japan's, like I said before, it, it pips China when it comes to infrastructure financing. Um, I think the, the number was to the tune of $300 billion as of 2020. And Japan has massive investments in Myanmar and, and, and Thailand as well, in Southeast Asia generally. And if I am... I stand to be corrected, but if you remember in October, ASEAN, uh, uh, sorry, let me see, November, ASEAN just concluded its uh, annual summits and it was decided that um, there will be, Myanmar would not be represented by a ministerial kind of representative or rather senior general Ming An Lang uh, will, will, will not be invited to the ASEAN summits. And that sent a strong signal Right, it, it's historic actually in ASEAN's history not to kind of uninvite or disinvite an ASEAN member state from the annual summits. And do you know which country was said to be uh, kind of pulling, uh, you know, uh, channeling some, some of the soft power behind the scenes? So it was Japan, uh, simply because Japan has a lot of investment presence in, in Myanmar. And, and Japan, of course, has a lot of traction with, with uh, ASEAN and ASEAN member states, given its very respectable history in, in dealing with, with ASEAN. So um, I think that there are some things to be learned, uh, again, from Japan when it comes to, you know, dealing with this tawny problem of, you know, how do you deal with countries in the Indo-Pacific that are less than democratic, but at the same time, advance your interests um, and goals um, at the same time, yeah. So I, I think I will uh, maybe answer that question on democracy a bit later. I'll just uh, give the floor to Romana and, and get to your point because um, what the EU says is not exactly what you're saying, William. So I'll just, I'll, I'll but Romana is the one representing the institutions here. So I'll give it, the first. Tara, and um, I, I think it's a little bit maybe too simplistic in a sense that, you know, European is not, European Union is not trying to create uh, mini me's in the world. Uh, we want to be interoperable and you can be interoperable only if you are predictable to each other through some standards that you agree on. And this is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about ideology, as you call it. I'm really talking about a certain set of standards that we have tested on our own skin, uh, have helped us gain sustainability, be it social, be it financial, be it environmental. So this is what we are talking about. We are talking about the basics, you know, that our investment should help create quality jobs, that our investment should advance gender, uh, gender equality, that our investments should be um, absolutely in adherence to international labor laws. We don't want uh, to have proceedings from, you know, children, uh, child labor or, 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 or slavery or similar. So these are the things we want to talk about. Uh, environmental sustainability for many uh, uh, countries in Asia, it's existential. It's really existential to invest uh, in, in a way which would um, uh, uh, support the transition and, and uh, help mitigate the climate change. Uh, financial uh, in, and, and just basic transparency. Uh, and, and I think these are all elements uh, that are part of, um, of something that we are engaging uh, in in terms of uh, discussion on standards. The second thing what is important for the European Union is if you have a higher quality regulatory environment that is understandable to European businesses, there will be much more European investment. 
also for us as institutions, it will be easier to help with uh, blending facilities. So it makes money cheaper, if you wish. It makes investment cheaper. And I think it's to the benefit of the recipient country. The third one has already been mentioned. It helps countries diversify. It helps countries become more resilient, um, makes them uh, have ability to choose, and if you wish, makes them more sovereign. So in that sense, it's a support for, for, for the resilience of countries and competitiveness of countries. Uh, and I, I'm yet to, to meet uh, someone who would not want to be able to be more competitive. So that's the third part. And the fourth part, I think maybe a mixture or, or is a bit about uh, maybe there are sometimes too many words. Uh, what we want to do uh, with Global Gateway is concrete projects, something that you can see, you can touch, you can make a photograph of. And finally, you can see on in your own experience, how does it work better for you? What does it bring to the community where it's invested? How, in terms of the life cycle, it pays off? What is the net value that you get through that, uh, through that investment? And I think there is generally an absolute convergence between uh, Japan, European Union, uh, US, and many other countries when it comes to these basics. So we are really talking about moving things forward. It's, it's, it's if you wish, race to the top in terms of standards, not, not race to the bottom in any, in any way. So, that is, uh, uh, for me, critical. Uh, it's not about ideology. It is really about common sense, uh, high quality standards that should help uh, economic growth and, and resilience of countries uh, where the investments are made. Uh, when it comes to, I think, a very interesting question, uh, a question about um, how do you invest in more complex environments, I would, I would say, or how, what do you do with non-bankable but existentially important projects? And this is where European Union has a huge uh, maneuvering space, if you wish, or a very big maneuvering space through its capacity to blend financing. I don't know if, if, if you know that, but in the same um, in the same time frame, from 2013 to 2018, uh, there was a coincidence between the BRI and the, the European sort of the MFF cycle. European Union institutions and member states gave almost the same amount of financing in ODA as China did through loans you cannot compare the quality of, of, of ODA or, or the value of ODA versus the loans that sometimes you know, come with very harsh, harsh conditions. So we have a very large uh, space there. And, and I think Mike is absolutely right. We have to watch at that space. I know there is some real interesting work done by the infrastructure agency in Singapore that is looking only at that margin at the margin of projects that are not yet bankable, but are super important, and then trying to create a scheme where they would become bankable. Uh, what is really um, interesting about this whole agenda is um, that is entirely really positive, if you wish. You can engage with countries on elements that are important for them and for you. And, and this is where uh, each region, each country will have to have a little bit of a tailored, uh, tailored made approach. We have uh, the best possible experience in the region we know best, and that's European Union, if you wish, or in the, in the community that we know best. So we have many decades of, of experience on connectivity, and we have learned many lessons uh, and we believe that we, we do understand how to overcome uh, uh, differences and, and how to create that predict predictability through standards and, and norms. Um, and I think this is something that uh, we have also worked on and tested in some regions that are closer to home. 
but uh, there, is a, there is a great ambition and an understanding that our investment in the Indo-Pacific is something that would be beneficial both to the region and to the European Union. Thanks a lot. Um, no, yeah, I just, just to stress uh, Romana's point, I think uh, the EU is not mentioning values so much. I mean, the, the, um, the op-ed that I read did mention it, but when you look at the strategy, it's really about putting forward standards. And it is certainly true that it's going to be harder in a way for countries to apply to the global gateway than it is to apply to the BRI because uh, credit from Beijing is, I will say this with air quotes, simpler and quicker to get. The EU is certainly aiming at increasing environmental standards. And so this is an issue. You can decide whether this is a value or not for you. I think from the EU side, it is perceived as a value, but what it is, is a standard. And the EU is saying, we want to encourage countries to go towards the digital and green transition, ideally simultaneously, because you know, it's one thing for the EU to do it. If the rest of the world doesn't follow, then it doesn't also really make sense. The European Green Deal is perceived by many countries from the Indo-Pacific as a green fortress. It's you know, the EU kind of blocking itself. So I think the global gateway is an answer also to these fears that were expressed by a number of, of uh, major partners in the region saying, well, the, the EU is again inward looking at shunning, shutting itself off from the world when actually I think it was trying to do precisely the contrary. So the question is, how do we work together? And I, I, one of the questions in the chat is how do we measure success? What, what can we expect as a massive European Indo-Pacific project that would uh, come to see the light of day in 10 years. You know, what could that be for you? I think it, I, I would love to hear an answer from the four of you. Is it on digital? Is it on transport? I'm guessing it's more digital. Typically the 5G infrastructure, is there a possibility for a European and Indo-Pacific alliance that would provide a very concrete alternative that would absolutely, you know, that can be political engagement and a political impulse. But of course, if this is uh, to see the light of day, then private companies need to get involved. It's not the, you know, no country or regional political entity is going to do that on their own. Is, would this be an answer? What kind, what would we be looking at? Maybe I can start with, with William and then move on to, to Mike and Romana. So that, Tara, and actually thanks for the clarification about how the, the EU treats uh, these projects. Uh, in terms of what uh, Romana was saying, that in, you know they have to be bankable and very basic uh, standards on transparency, uh, creating quality jobs. So that's 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 an interest. That's uh, encouraging. Uh, you know, it's encouraging to hear. Um, when it comes to like what kind of projects can we see uh, in ten years? I think like what Tara is saying. I think. Um, kind of the digital economy, 5G networks will be useful if you can identify some projects. I think it was recently reported that the United States, Japan, and Australia uh, have come together to supply financing for, for building of uh, 5G mobile uh, uh, data networks in uh, three Pacific Island uh, countries. So I think this, this, this is an area I think the European Union um, excels in. And of course, the, the, the question here is finding the, the, the country or the number of countries uh, where, where you can um, actually gain traction. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, what Michael was saying about, you know, the, when we talk about digital economy, we, we can't just talk about mobile networks or undersea submarine cables, but we have to talk about trade facilitation and, you know, how you you know, apps, you know, how, you know, like Singapore has a good way of uh, uh, getting its citizens access to, you know, self-servicing their own digital identities on the internet. And, and if you can come up with viable solutions that are, you know, financed by Global Gateway uh, in some of the lesser developed uh, ASEAN member states, that would be, that'd be great. I mean, that would be exactly what Romana was talking about when she says that you have to be some well, well, an app is not something that you can see, but it's it, you know it's something that you can see on your phone. <laughs> if th this takes off in in you know a country like Thailand or or the Philippines, uh, that 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 would be really good news, uh, for this region. 
Thanks. That's very, very useful indeed. Um, Rocky, I don't know if you were with us. I was asking, do you, can you think of a specific uh, project that the, the European Union and the Indo-Pacific countries could lead together on connectivity, uh, bringing, of course, the private sector in, because this is also about building, um, I think, the, the, the expression that Borel and Urpilainen use is creating links, not dependencies. So how can we... Is there a project that you could think of that, that would be helpful? One or several, by the way. Uh, I would also echo like the similar sentiment by Dr. William in that 5G and digital connectivity is definitely an area where the EU and Indo-Pacific countries should focus on. Uh, one other area of cooperation I could think of right now, um, even though it's not specifically on connectivity, is definitely on sustainability issues. Um, I'm not sure if these are uh, issues or connectivity in general uh, or with certain projects, but it would be great, for example, if the EU or like other countries in the Pacific can agree on certain standards of what constitutes uh, sustainable uh, products, for example. There have been, um, coming from Indonesia and Malaysia, to a certain extent, there have been many rumbles in the region regarding um, carbon, border, carbon border adjustment, for example, that the EU is planning to implement and whether um, that is even WTO uh, legal, uh, how that would actually um, inhibit development uh, for certain projects um, in, in the Pacific. Um, it's not necessarily connectivity uh, traditionally per se, but agreeing on what constitutes sustainability between uh, countries in the EU and in the Pacific would definitely be a good start for further cooperation. Thanks a lot. Um, first, Mike and then Romana. Yes, well, again, as much as I realize we have to sort of work on the, on the visible projects and, and I think the Global Gateways, you know, communication mentions that submarine cable, you know, from between uh, Europe and Latin America is a very visible one, you know, having something like that also in the Indo-Pacific would definitely uh, would definitely be be useful to, to show that to appeal for the success. But again, I think we also have to change our mindset and, and understand that it, it does not always have to be, you know, the visible projects. Um, because, for example, you know, building the hard infrastructure is one, um, but but what type of infrastructure that is, you know, will also depend on uh, on the country, um, right? Mobile connections um, are, are extremely important also in, in less in, in rural areas. Um, so the, the, the need for infrastructure, you know, is, is, is different and the ways that systems operate will be different there. And sometimes also the, the digital skills um, are really important. And I think, you know, that's, so let's not forget also about the capacity building. But again, give that, you know, a beautiful label so that it, it will seem like a, uh, you know, a, a, a flagship project, if you will. Just as, you know, somebody, uh, I think, Rocky, you just mentioned, um, you know, Japan's uh, the, the Coast Guard ships and, uh, and, you know, assistance with, you know, protecting your economic zone. That's, that's also, you know, something that is, you know, does involve, you know, the, the goodies, you know, the ships on and, and, and the one hand, but at the same time, it's really also about capacity building, right? And I think that's also where the, where the EU has, has quite a bit on offer. Um, and that's, you know, doesn't, is, is not really discussed so often. Um, it's interesting, I was talking to uh, somebody the other, uh, you know, just in, in one of the Dutch officials the other day, and obviously the Netherlands is now also talking with EU member states about, you know, what are gonna be next steps. And, you know, we have the French presidency upcoming, of course, you know, great trigger for this event. Um, and then we have the Czech presidency and they, they also have to internalize this and they are thinking about priorities and I think cyber will be one of them. Uh, and surely, you know, with the French and their real estate in, in the Pacific Maritime will be another. Um, but we have seen ships going to the region, right? And we, we know that there is a sustained uh, French presence in the region. Um, so perhaps, uh, you know, the, the more challenging part is, is again the capacity building. Uh, because what exactly is needed, uh, what countries, you know, where, who, who do you engage with? That is more complicated, perhaps even than thinking through in your own country and making the decision to send a ship. Um, so again, an investment uh, and, and, the, and the ownership, the cooperation between EU member states, 
is in, is is really important. Um, and you know that's what we call that Team Europe approach these days. You know, it's not just about Brussels. What's happening in Brussels is just you know, in a way, it's only you know one uh, and, and not unimportant, but one element. There's so many EU member states that need to act on their own niches. And then there's the private sector that we really have to engage so much more than what we're used to in, in, in Europe. Um, so I think that's, um, that is really important. And I, I really appreciate you know, the fact that the French presidency is highlighting uh, not just the Indo-Pacific, but within that connectivity as a, as a really important one. Um, and let's see you know, what, what flagship project uh, they might come up with during their presidency. Yes, we will be following that quite closely from here too. Um, Romana, one, one idea of a, of a project that uh, Europe and the Indo-Pacific could lead together? I, uh, I would fully agree that I think digital is going to be in the heart of, uh, of uh, things that we will be doing. I, would just, I just remember that maybe six, seven months ago, there was a, a very successful cybersecurity training uh, triangle US, EU, ASEAN. So there are, there are many things that, that will need uh, upgrading, but I mean, digital is going to define everything. So I think in, in a sense, uh, it's just only natural that it will be one of the key things. The second one for sure, environment and the green transition. Uh, I mean, it's so directly linked with the well-being and even survival of, of some smaller states that uh, I think there is no doubt uh, and it's something that is um, a common challenge. Uh, Europe can do whatever it wants to do, but if, if the world uh, uh, and everyone is not pulling together, uh, we will not um, come where we want to be. So I think in that sense, a lot of investment and support for the transition will have to be there. Uh, understanding the local circumstances and, and, and helping move there. And then um, Mike touched on it, and, and somehow in all of these discussions, we always uh, forget or, or don't talk about human connectivity uh, in, 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 in terms of the uh, investment in knowledge, investment in innovation and research, investment in, in uh, empowering the new generation to, to be able to uh, be fully interoperable in terms of skills and knowledge with, uh, with their um, counterparts across the world. I think that investment in, uh, in knowledge is something that is an integral part of connectivity. Uh, and this is what I said at the very beginning, connectivity is not just things, it's important to see things, but it's much more comprehensive. And uh, I, I firmly believe that knowledge and innovation is one of the key elements of, of what we uh, uh, want to, to work on. So um, in, in that sense, um, there is a lot uh, still to be discussed and see how to do that in the, in the best way. For me, what I'm kind of obsessed with is to look at this in a way that would be user-friendly you know, it's an enormous amount of coordination and it's easy to, uh, to scare people with all these elements that have to come and be dealt with. So I think we need to look for models that work and, and that can be utilized, that can be understood, that can be explained and that can be uh, finally implemented. So again, uh, European Union has a lot of historical knowledge on, on how to do connectivity. And I think this knowledge can come handy to, to regions uh, to look at these experiences uh, and, and work together with us. Thanks a lot. Um, so we've seen a reaction from China already to the global gateway proposition. Uh, China has said that it was going to put four times what the EU is supposed to put on the table. So uh, 1.2 trillion uh, euros of investment in the region. Do you see a uh, potential for, so this is an economic reaction. Do you see potential for other types of reaction from China on this uh, high-end European engagement in, in the Indo-Pacific? Who, is there one of, one of you who wants to go first? Um, Mike, I can see that you're already unmuted, so <laughs> you can go. 
Well, I heard, I, I saw a Chinese response even before the communication was published, you know, and, and, and partly understandable. They were sort of, in, you know, an indirect punch at, oh, wow, another vision on, the, on paper, right? China actually does the action and the, and the EU does the papers, you know, that, that fine from their perspective. And there's some, you know, sense of truth uh, to it, you know, and because, again, we really have to make more visible what we have been doing, you know, that's where, you know, we've been lagging. Uh, and also invest more in, you know, the, the real project. So, you know, point well taken. I even heard, you know, an Australian ambassador once say that, you know, it's much more difficult to do an infrastructure project than to 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 write a vision, you know, another communication. So the fact that we are now, the EU is now negotiating digital partnership uh, uh, um, uh, agreements, you know, that's that's a wonderful thing. But I think at the same time, again, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm really going to be looking for more, you know, concrete action on that. So in that sense, I thought the communication this time, it really had also details about governance structures, um, you know, about specific instruments, financial instruments uh, that, that, that are going to be used. Um, so there's definitely, I think, you know, reason for to understand that, you know, this, this will be different this time. So, you know, the fact that the Chinese, you know, try to top this, you know, that means that they're taking it serious. I would take that as a compliment as the EU. Very well. Um, William? I just clarify, Tara, what, what communications are you talking about uh, where you mentioned 1.2 trillion euros? What so the that? Chinese government reacted saying that they were doubling down on their uh, infrastructure investment. They didn't say that it was going to be part of the BRI. They said we are actually doing even more than, the, a lot more than what the European Union is proposing in the region. Uh, so yeah. this a few days ago. Yeah. So back to one of the first points that I made. Um, I think the more the merrier. I mean, in 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 terms of infrastructure financing, right? Uh, whether it's BRI, whether it's Japan, whether it's the EU, whether it's the G7, and talking about China, I think uh, Xi Jinping. I think last year or. Uh, about 18 months ago, he announced the kind of refashioning of Belt and Road in kind of in response to Western and kind of global community um, comments about, you know, it being lack of transparency and kind of high interest rates. And he thought he's, he sought to refashion BRI, you know, with increasing transparency and sustainability and in the way that the, the financing elements are, are actually structured. So in, in a sense, I think that with Global Gateway and what the EU is doing, it's actually, you know, it, you, you can treat it as a backhanded compliment from Beijing in the sense that, you know, uh, it actually triggers, it makes them think twice about you know, uh, in the way that they access projects, the financial, the financing terms. Um, and I think the, the, the Chinese have done a mid-cost correction, but that's all to, it's all to the good. I mean, um, the, the $1.2 trillion figure might be a kind of a top line figure, but I think we, we have heard that the Chinese have actually become more circumspect in actually uh, with some uh, BRI, BRI projects you know, in the Pacific and, and that's all to the good. I think on, on a more general point, I think the Chinese are very wary when um, external powers outside of the Indo-Pacific uh, want to kind of stamp their imprint uh, on the region and that applies to the United States and that applies to the European Union as well. Um, so I, I think that that comment from Beijing probably stems from that. Yeah. Thanks a lot. We have one minute left. Uh, Rocky, Romana, do you want to jump in very, very quickly? Ah, Romana has unmuted. Very, very briefly, uh, what I think is super important that the, there is a level playing field, that there is an alternative, that there is a good quality alternative uh, and that countries uh, can make their own sovereign choices. Uh, and I think this is uh, what, we, what we want to see. Thanks a lot, Rocky. Um, just to be very quick, I also like, echo that as well. Having options is a great, um, is actually what, um, setting Southeast Asia, what we want. Um, 
I also have a concrete example on this um, in the Jakarta Bandung High Speed Rail. Um, without the presence of Japan in the competitive bidding process, Indonesia would not be able to leverage uh, the China drop the government guarantee requirement. And that's the first one. The second one, we also got China to agree that China needs to have a local um, Chinese workers and local workers ratio within the contract because Indonesia as other countries um, in the region have um, historical sensitivities towards Chinese workers working in Chinese projects. So we also got that because of that, because of the presence of other options. So we definitely welcome the opportunity of other alternatives to diversify our cooperation. Thanks a lot. That was extremely useful. Many thanks to the four of you. Um, we will now be taking an hour break and uh, be resuming at 2 p.m. CET on the green transition. My colleagues just put the link up in the chat. If you haven't registered yet, please join us for that and uh, thank my, my stellar panel once again. Thank, thanks to all. <laughs>